Hi, everybody, and welcome to another Cyber 101. This week, we are here to talk about offensive cybersecurity. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, Cyber 101 is the R Street Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats team um, to teach some of the basics of cyber policy um, to people who don't know anything about cybersecurity. Uh, today, I have two panelists joining me. Um, so in the past, uh, we've had one panelist to give a presentation, but today we had two excellent speakers who are here um, to tell you a bit about cybersecurity. Um, and I'll just give a bit, bit of a brief introduction before we launch into questions. Um, so first we have Gary Korn. Um, Gary is the director of the Technology, Law and Security Program um, at American University, where he's also an adjunct, adjunct professor of uh, cyber and national security law. Um, he is also a senior fellow with the R Street team. Um, before uh, his life at American and R Street, he was a, the general counsel to US Cyber Command, um, where he spent five years and has held a number of other senior level positions, um, including deputy legal counsel to the chairman of the Joint, Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, operational law branch office in the office of Judge Advocate General of the Army, um, as well as many others. And then also we have Bryson Bort joining us. Um, Bryson is the founder and CEO of Scythe, uh, which is a startup that is building a next generation attack emulation platform. Um, and he's also the founder and CEO of Grimm, which is a boutique cybersecurity consultancy. Um, he also co-founded ICS Village, which is a nonprofit um, advancing awareness of um, industrial control system security, uh, and you may have heard him before because he hosts the Hack the Plant um, podcast dedicated to cybersecurity and critical infrastructure. Um, and he is also a uh, R Street senior fellow. So thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. Good to be here. And sorry for my wife yelling at the dog in the background. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it happens. Um, so as we get started today, um, let's, let's maybe start with making sure that our audience here um, sort of gets a bit of a background knowledge on who um, who everyone they need to know about when it comes to offensive cybersecurity. So Gary, who are the major players um, in the US when it comes to offensive cyber operations? Yeah, I mean, it's, it really is a, a team sport. Um, there are some elements of the government that are sort of, I'd say more proactive in out of network operations, operations, what we talk about gray and red space, um, you know, adversary space and intermediate space outside of the United States. Um, but, you know, ultimately there's the intelligence build behind operations that have to be involved. There is coordination with uh, CISA and Homeland Security to be, you know, prepped and ready if if there is any blowback, all sorts of things, coordination with the FBI, because they can play a role in what I would say proactive activity and operations through the legal processes, court process and mutual legal assistance treaties. But when it comes down to sort of non-consensual um, out of network operations, what we typically think about as offensive, um, you know, that capability like others is resident either in the Department of Defense um, or under, you know, covert action authority, potentially, um, the CIA, right? And so you know, I'm not talking about any specific operation, but generally that's where capability and authorities might lie. And that is the focal point in the Department of Defense is obviously US Cyber Command um, for, for engaging in that type of activity. So obviously it's just sort of implied, um, depending on the, the particulars of any individual um, cyber operation will obviously impact the mission cycle. Um, but Bryson, maybe speaking a bit more generally, um, if the US wanted to conduct an offensive cyber operation, can you talk us a little bit about what that process looks like? Can you walk us through maybe what the mission cycle might look like at a broad level? Let's uh, follow from where, oh man, is that my, my microphone still acting up? No, we can hear you. Okay, all right. So. It's, it's the Chinese, they're, they're affecting this, this operation. We have offensive operations happening right here. This is what we get for using Zoom. Not, not, not picking on Zoom, sorry, that was, that was inappropriate. So uh, he mentioned red and gray. Let's, let's step back and paint the world into only three colors. So Gary is a smart army officer. I'm the kind of army officer where the blank look is not faked. And so the world is three colors, red, bad people, gray, everywhere in between to getting to good people, blue. 
So when we're thinking about ourselves, we're blue, a, a network that is needed for um, force projection to run operations, that's blue. Gray is everything in between the way we get there. And so that's the first thing is that the threat model, of course, has shift, shifted significantly because of the internet. The internet is the world's greatest reach out, wake up, eat your Moscow Wheaties and go out and touch blue. Um, and so when we start looking at what that cycle is like, Gary gave an excellent introduction on one, the folks who are putting the offensive hands on keyboard, but there are a lot of coordinating uh, elements to being able to do that. And this all ties into the fact that I like to say cyber is not just about cyber. There are a lot of re relevant parts as we start to look at our ability to establish effects, um, which we'll say in the battlefield, but effectively effects that we're pushing back on gray and red, um, which are beyond just computer elements. There are lots of other ways that you can reach out to touch somebody to get them to stop doing what you want to do besides them putting what they're doing on computing. So the first part is that mission package. Um, what is the target? What are the targets? What is the purpose of those? And if you think about for a lot of what we're doing, a lot of that really is driven by information. Most offensive operations are really intelligence driven. We're looking at getting an understanding either into how another government is thinking, because a lot of these governments that we have trouble with are a lot more closed off. There is not the freedom of press. There's not that freedom of information. It's not as easy as having the conversation to be able to understand what's going on. So we need to try to find different ways to really getting into the mindset besides what we're seeing on, you know, the proverbial TV. Then there's an iterative element of having those mission packages and collection requirements where as we're having these targets, we're gaining information, we're getting more information. And when we're starting to look at that in the technical realm of offensive cyber, we're building that out to understand potentially who is connected to whom, um, because you can't always just march up to the hardest target and get onto that computer. So you try to figure out softer targets that are in that vicinity and building things out. So we see this, of course, a lot in uh, law enforcement with how they are able to turn assets in a criminal network as they're able to identify the network of information to be able to close in. And then, of course, is finally, we're now going to launch something. We're going to do something. Well, the first part is you can't just march up with the American flag and say, hey, can you execute my code for me, please? So we have to find different ways. And this is what that gray space is where both sides are looking at how do we use tradecraft to hide our tracks? Some of that is financial. We wanna look like we are tied to a different organization or we are something else. Some of that is trying to blend in with others. And then uh, reusing Gary's term of non-consensual, there's also the possibility that you are using somebody else's asset without their permission so that you're looking like them. Then you gain access. Now, of course, the most common way of access that everybody likes to talk about in more of what I call the Hollywood approach is the zero day. This is the really sexy part of the vulnerability market where there is a vulnerability in a hardware or software in that red space that we're going to take control of. So when I send something to that software, that hardware, I get unauthorized access in. Um, other ones, because uh, there are actually only five categories of access in the world, you can summarize all of the ways to get in through just five categories. Um, so abusing those internet authentication mechanisms is one way I just described there. Um, supply chain, of course, has become recently popularized because of solar winds. So the fact is that, again, that network of folks, and that could be vendors, that could be other devices, that could be understanding those different parameters, um, getting access to them and then coming in. Um, and then, of course, the one that everybody likes to think about with credential theft is phishing. I send you an email. It looks legitimate. You click on it. I'm in. We just had our cybersecurity training, so I'm well acquainted with all sorts of emails that uh, require you to have that have links that you're not supposed to uh, click. Um, Gary, Bryson just started talking about some of like the technical side, um, but I know that there's also a, a whole sphere of legal um, and policy considerations that have to be taken into account as well. Um, so can you kind of walk us through what the legal and policy landscape looks like as far as like a um, conducting an offensive cyber operation? Sure, in broad strokes um, and, and sort of stepping back, Bryson's absolutely right. There's, there's the intel side of all of this. Um, 
some people will refer to that as offensive as well. It is an out of network operation. Oftentimes you're gaining access for the point of exploiting and, and pulling back data and information. Uh, but what you're not necessarily doing is delivering effect against that particular device or seeking to achieve consequence or effect in the physical world outside of, you know, by, by, by means of, but outside of cyberspace. Um, so there's a spectrum there from, from a domestic side of the house, right? We've got domestic law and policy and we have international law that guides and impacts what we're doing. I mean, the first kind of thing I want to know is who, who's doing the activity back to that part we started from? Is it, is it Cyber Command as a military organization? Is it another organization? Is it an intelligence agency or organization? Law enforcement, who's doing it? That kind of defines a line of authorities that they're going to be operating under. Um, you know, for what purpose, against what target, and ultimately, you know, where does that target reside and what effect or consequence is going to be delivered? Right? That's a lot to unpack but it really starts to define and scope what the legal and policy parameters will be for a particular operation. Um, and, and let me give you an example. On the international law side, if we are in that intel world where we're collecting data, more than likely the general view is international law does not prohibit or prescribe espionage. That came up a lot in the solar winds discussion and made a lot of folks uncomfortable Right with the notion that my goodness, we've just been had at scale, but all indications, at least um, in the public record, are showing that that was an access operation that you know only certain points may have been exploited more deeply for the purpose of gaining intel. Right, that's espionage, not prohibited by international law, and we can come back to more international law discussion about boundaries later. But on the domestic side, you know, we say everything has to trace back to a constitutional power. That either resides in the president's inherent authority under Article II of the Constitution or in Congress's authority or somewhere in a combination thereof, right? And, and there's legal frameworks to kind of work your way through that, but you have to find that trace. Um, it helps oftentimes if you have something in statute that's also backing up what the president's doing there are times, though, when the president will invoke inherent Article II presidential authority as commander in chief, right, and chief of foreign relations, et cetera. Um, so you, you find that trace, that will vary and be different for each organization. So we've seen over the last several years where, in order to enable the military to be more proactive in this space, Congress has taken a number of steps, both in sort of general policy statements and more specifically, especially in 2019 in the passing of certain statutes that said the president, back, we back the president's authority in effect um, and cyber command can be directed to conduct offensive operations against, and it listed four countries, it won't surprise you, Russia, China, North Korea and Iran, right? To counter their ongoing um, you know, malicious cyber activities. They also passed some legislation to clarify the line between covert action, which is defined in statute and regulated by law and by policy, um, only conducted by the CIA. Um, but there's the exception of trad traditional military activities, uh, which needed some clarification about how cyber fit into that and Congress stepped in and that, you know, that fed into enabling um, a more proactive strategy that we saw coming to fruition in 2018 and 2019, right? Add on to that though, like we all look for where are my orders coming from? And sort of that's the policy side of the house. That's a little harder to discuss in an open forum, but you know, there it's, it's understood that the last administration uh, revoked presidential policy directive 20 instituted President, the National Security Policy Memorandum 13, a different framework that had broader delegation down to departments and agencies. Um, and as the DOD General Counsel has spoken about publicly, you know, specifically to the Department of Defense, to give mission authority and direction to the department to actually conduct certain activities. And within that, then there are parameters. So once you've lined up that domestic legal framework and you, you have the authorities, 
You then also have to measure it against that international law question because we are committed to our international legal obligations. Um, and there's lots of questions there about thresholds and what's, what's prohibited by international law and not. Um, that's emerging, it's evolving, uh, but it's something that, that certainly the Department of Defense takes very seriously and the, the national government does too. Thanks. Um, I'd like to just take the moment to also remind our listeners that if they have any questions um, for either Bryson or Gary, they can feel free to put it in the Q&A. We will leave some time for listener questions at the end. So as you're listening, if you think of anything, just pop it in there and we'll see it. Um, but sort of going back to the sort of policy and legal framework um, and sort of the, the, some of the shifting frameworks um, and policy decisions, Gary, can you tell us a little bit about Defend Forward um, and how that sort of plays into offensive cybersecurity? Sure. I mean, if you sort of go back and unpack, um, you know, Defend Forward, in, in, in certainly my view, um, is an operational concept. It's an operational concept that was embedded in at the heart of a pretty significant shift in strategy in 2018. Um, nuggets of that in the national security strategy, mostly in the DOD cyber strategy that came out. Um, and th this notion of at times you will have to conduct out of network operations to achieve national objectives. And especially in the area of what I say, you know, counter cyber, where you're using now, we're, we're not just gonna sit back passively any further and rely on perimeter defense. You have to also incorporate an active defense or, right, or offense to carry the fight forward to the adversary and keep the adversary off guard um, and degrade the adversary's ability to, to, to conduct operations against us. Defend forward at the end of the day to me is all about that. It's about, um, you know, I've, I've made this comparison a number of times. We learned a lesson after September 11th that you can't deter nihilist terrorist organizations. And so defending at the, at the nation's border, we saw was not effective enough and it required a more proactive take, take the fight to the adversary to throw the adversary off cycle in decision planning, the ability to pull together resources. It's a very similar concept in my view um, to be proactive in disrupting the enemy's or the adversary's ability to conduct cyber operations against us. Next few questions are for whichever one of you wants to answer. Um, but what is probably the number one misconception uh, people that you run into seem to have about offensive cyber operations? That it works the way it does in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I started off by I, by pointing out the the ODE. Um, uh, ODE is actually not as commonly used as you would think. Um, it's not necessary. It's expensive. Um, the second part is that. Um, the tools that are used post-access, where I talked about the attack chain to, to moving into red, uh, those are usually very, they're, all, they're primarily custom developed, um, although uh, we have seen adversaries use open source tooling because, again, what works, works. Um, you're not going to spend more on something you don't need. And there's also the advantage to having something that's impossible to trace from a tooling perspective, uh, but they can be very complicated frameworks. Um, and so there is a lot of thought that goes into what to deploy to what purpose for that reason. Um, and I guess the third, again, going back to the Hollywood thing is it's not quite as exciting as I think people think. Um, I know that when I look at uh, commercial penetration testing and red teaming, that's the closest that people think the real thing is like, and it is nowhere close to what the real thing is like. Um, it's a lot of patience and time um, and a lot more focus on stealth and accomplishing a mission versus um, where I really feel like a lot of what I see with penetration testing and red teaming is would be more on the order of smash and grab because you just don't have the time and resource to uh, do that equivalent that equivalence. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And just pivot off at the third point there. Um, I think it's the sort of the escalation fear, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that we should sit back and let the Russia's, China's, Iran's, and North Korea's of the world continue to do what they're doing. Um, they're achieving strategic effect against us. It's harmful, and we need to be 
you know, more, we need to step up our game in, in controlling the space. At the same time, there's long been a worry and a reticence about conducting out of network operations, whether it's to counter that activity or, you know, at times to use cyber for our own, right, advance our own interests. Uh, there are things you can do. The escalation worry, the everything is an act of war in cyberspace, um, you know, it, it, th there's lots of activity that can be done in a very controlled and managed way to great effect for our behalf in manage and not, you know, in manage escalation concerns, right? Um, th that's one thing that I think has been driving policy thinking, uh, just sort of over, over risk um, analysis at times. I want to I want to follow on that thread that Gary just said there. Um, the ability to conduct this kind of disruption and effectively get away with it at a nation state level, where and I would say in a prior era that same level of damage would have caused some kind of uh, would have probably provoked a war, um, and to be able to do it so cheaply, I think those two components are what have made offensive cyber such a compelling. Uh, approach for uh, the four adversaries that Gary named earlier. I want to also follow up on that escalation question because I think that's something a lot of people ask about. Um, and I, I think it was last week, uh, NATO had a meeting and they released a statement where they said um, that allies recognize that the impact of significant malicious cumulative cyber activities might in certain circumstances be considered as amounting to an armed attack. As we know, there's a lot of fears and questions about, you know, that escalation and what does actually count of an, uh, as an act of war um, when it comes to cyber. So do you, either of you have thoughts on um, what that threshold really looks like? Um, are people's concerns and fears really overblown? Is this something we shouldn't back be worried about? Um, how is the policy landscape sort of coalescing around? Are they coming to a conclusion? The needle is sort of hovering and moving a little bit, I would say. Um, you know, there's, there tends to be, first of all, when you de determine that something is an armed attack, which for most states in the international community, that is considered, you know, a prohibited use of force under the UN Charter, but of a significantly grave level that triggers the victim state's right to use force in self-defense without having to get approval from the Security Council. The U.S., has a different perspective. The US perspective has long been that a use of force and an armed attack are the same thing. So if you cross that lower threshold of a use of force, we will use force in response, right? So that's that plays in some of the discussions. Everyone tends to agree, right? It's the know it if you see it standard. If we would consider it to be a use of force by bombs dropping, et cetera, it's gonna be a use of force. But it isn't limited to that. Right, and there have been signals from some states like France um, and others that they would consider potentially like substantial economic harm, sustained economic harm caused through cyber means to cross the use of force threshold. Uh, and so I say that needle's moving. And the other thing, and then I think what's interesting about the NATO statement, it's significant because that is in a collective self-defense treaty the Article 5 triggering moment for when the states can use force in collective self-defense. And there's a recognition in that cumulative language that cyber, you know, it isn't just a one-off sometimes. It's, you know, sometimes the aggregate of a campaign can potentially hit that, that threshold uh, that would traditionally trigger self-defense authorities under international law. So first of all, I, I need to I need to take umbrage at him calling it armed attack because I'm I'm only one arm today. So Gary, I know you I know that was a shot at me. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to fire back though and point out that Gary just um, connoted use of force at the same way that the Supreme Court defined pornography, which is we'll know it when we see it. So thank you for taking offensive cyber there, uh, and. Uh, this also ties to the USA Today article that uh, Paul Rosenzweig and I wrote, uh, the op-ed we wrote uh, a couple of weeks ago, where we saw a big outcry at Colonial Pipeline. Well, it turns out that oil is going to get folks' attention in a hydrocarbon economy, 
And our kind of playoff of that was noting that, well, what fuel, fuels the human economy is coffee. And that that would be the next thing that would get that kind of, those would, that would be the brown line playing off the cyber red line of the question of when is it crossing um, some sort of response. I think the primary purpose for the Article 5 statement by NATO was one signaling to Russia that here is a line that we're starting to get fed up because uh, particularly again with ransomware, um, while we, we don't know exactly the level of whether it's state supported to state tolerated, a lot of the ransomware operators are happening under their purview and they're causing significant disruption to Western economies. Um, I mean, we're talking billions of dollars of damage and I mean, a complete friction to global business and they're doing it without any sign of stopping. And so I don't, I'm not tying the article five statement directly to the ransomware scourge, but I am saying that it is clear how Russia has been increasingly aggressive and almost adventurous in finding different ways to apply offensive cyber with uh, very little abatement on our part to stopping it. That's a really good, interesting point. And I'm kind of, I want to pick up on something you mentioned earlier, um, which is the difference between uh, state sponsored and sort of state tolerated um, and attribution in general, which is, you know, I think we all have a pretty good idea about which nation states pose the most threat um, in terms of offensive cyber operations. But a lot of times when it comes to you know, attributing attacks, there's a lot more that goes into it. It's actually sometimes very difficult to um, attribute attacks. Why is that? What is the difference between a state-sponsored attack or a state-tolerated attack? And why aren't we more forthcoming in attributing different attacks? Well, so you asked two different questions. Uh, I'll start with the challenges of attribution. Um, first point is that uh, government and military intelligence and military do not have as hard a time um, providing attribution as the private sector does because there are a lot more resources with a lot different things. Um, the private sector, for the most part, for the most part, primarily has to rely on traditional technical means, analyzing code, trying to trace back where the code is calling back to, and trying to understand that to what could be, you know, particular threat intelligence, active adversaries, and threat modeling, whereas the government level has the advantage of being able to have all sorts of all source analysis and intelligence. Um, turns out I could figure out if that was a cyber attack that they did, if somebody who was a part of that agency said they did it. I don't have to track all of that back, right? There are a lot of different means available to being able to establish that attribution um, because this is what the, the government does, right? Looking at what adversaries are doing um, in an offensive manner and trying to identify it before it happens and certainly try to figure out as it happens. So we do not get caught with the strategic surprise, um, which I think is the big fear that we have with all of this. Um, the levels of state involvement, um, I can't remember who to attribute the model to. Um, I, the, the person that comes to mind the most is Jay Healy up out of Columbia. Um, and it's the different levels of from all the way, you know, this is the state doing this all the way down to the state's not involved at all. And then all of that gray area to, like I said, well, we know you're doing it, but we're just not going to, you know, we're not going to, we know that's breaking the law, but we're not going to arrest you to, well, we're going to more than look the other way. We're going to drop some things that maybe you can use to, hey, you're doing that. We'd like you to use these tools or here's a list of targets and we'd like you to go after them. So I'm not casting any aspersion here that anybody in particular is doing any of that little, the, that gray area there, but it is in the realm of hypothesis that we do see um, what I'll call more proxy and private use um, tied into that uh, state spectrum on offensive cyber. Yeah, let me, first of all, a point. We, we do focus a lot, and in my opinion at times, too much on the attribution question. Um, we we want to know what's happening. We want to know where it's coming from. That's understandable. Uh, there's, and Bryson alluded to this, an overemphasis on the on the technical forensic aspect of attribution. There's all source means by which you can achieve the sense of understanding and certainty about what's happening, right? But also, when you get back into the sort of counter cyber space. Um, there's activity that you can conduct that 
would be consistent with international law to be it'd still be disruptive, I don't necessarily need to be able to attribute in order to do that, right? If I know there's a botnet out there and it's being currently used for a DDoS and I can touch that botnet, uh, there's things I might be able to do without having to attribute who's got who's behind the botnet, right? So that's one point. But let me let me put it this way: it's all about how and when you can hold a state legally responsible to include your authority to use self-help remedies, potentially including force, right? Not necessarily force, but potentially. And so by analogy, if you own a 10 acre piece of property and there's a, a group of criminals that are way off in the back, you know, 10th acre in the corner, you don't know about it. You're in your house watching TV and they're tunneling across into the neighbor's yard to commit burglary. Are you legally responsible for burglary or what they're doing, right? International law speaks to this question and it does have an, a standard and it's when it's an organ of a state and you can prove it's an organ of a state to basically a reasonableness standard, you can hold the state responsible for what that organ is doing. And if it's violating international law, there's consequence, right? If it's a non-state entity, the test is a little more strict. And it's you have to demonstrate that that other state is exercising effective control. That's direction and control over that and that's non-state entities activities and operations. Right. There's a whole other area called due diligence, which places responsibility on states to not allow their territory to be used to the harm of other states. We just saw in the most recent UNGGE report, whether or not that is actually a rule of international law, certainly applicable in cyber, is a point of open contention, right? Open contention. And so, uh, you know, and what that requires, you know, it, you can only take, you know, it only requires you to take what feasible measures to disrupt something that's happening. It's not a duty of prevention. It's once you're on notice, uh, can you take feasible measures to disrupt it? And if you say, I can take feasible measures, but I don't like you, so I'm not gonna do anything and I'm gonna let these criminals continue, then there's an argument that that state's violating international law and there may be consequence to flow from that. That's where attribution comes in with the non-state actor piece, right? Can you basically de determine that the non-state actors are acting as agents of a state? And that's not always gonna be the case. Um, and so there's something to be said for not necessarily saying international law like you can be penalized through countermeasures or force or other things for stuff that non-state actors are doing without your direction, knowledge, control, or involvement, right? I'm gonna ask a follow-up question that's actually from the audience, um, which is when it comes, when it comes to um, escalation, attribution, um, working in the international sphere, um, is there a need for allies to have the same definition of cyber aggressions when it comes to escalation um, and attribution? How do we make sure that we're speaking the same language um, in terms of like creating international norms? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know that you can realistically achieve the same definition. Kim Jong-un claims that, you know, sending balloons over, over the DMZ is, you know, an act of war, right? That, so, um, you're going to have your outliers. You're going to have rogue states. Um, I think generally it's, it comes down to understanding sort of where thresholds and red lines do lie. Um, and there's benefit in common understanding of that. Um, but this is why we had red phones during the Cold War, right? At a certain point, too, you have to have, there's signaling and, and communication between adversaries. So at least they understand um, what that is. And sometimes a degree of ambiguity actually works to your favor. So that's a delicate dance. Um, it, but, you know, achieving beyond the generalities of the UN Charter prohibits using force. Well, what's force? It doesn't define it. There's general understandings. But again, we see that that's France, the Netherlands may have a bit of a different view than some other states about what that means and what those thresholds are. 
Uh, so last month we uh, brought uh, our street cybersecurity emerging threats uh, policy director uh, Tatiana Bolton um, here to discuss defensive cybersecurity um, and in particular the role of CISA. Um, in the U.S., it seems that defensive cybersecurity and offensive cybersecurity are kind of separated. Do you think that's a good separation? Is, is that effective? Um, should they be combined into one giant cybersecurity agency of, say? Um, how, how does that sort of relationship work? I mean, I can take a swing. Go for it. I'll, I'll back you up. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at the DOD model as a, as a microcosm, there, it, it's not separate. They're separate mission areas. You have teams that are trained and enabled to, to perform different types of activities, whether you know it's internal network defense versus external activity, but one drives the other, right? They have to be coordinated and synchronized efforts. And I think that's what we are trying to achieve at a national level. Um, but who is given the mission role and responsibility to perform different aspects of that is kind of a different question. I think there's a deep discussion over time as to whether our, our legal and policy frameworks, which understandably treat what DO, uh, DHS and CISA can do differently than what DOD can do, um, matches, that's a, that's a very geographically based sort of model over time. And the internet is not a particularly geographically based structure. So we certainly see some incongruities at times, um, but you know, should we be having CISA do offensive, you know, out of network external operations? Um, you know, that's a deeper discussion and the answer is probably no, I would agree with Bryson. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be intense coordination between DOD, DHS, CISA, the FBI, et cetera, which is happening. And it's happening at a more robust level. It ain't perfect, um, but my experience is everyone's trying to achieve that and it's happening more and more over time. What drives that question is by definition, offense is finding things that defense doesn't know about. And everybody wants to share that because those vulnerabilities that exist elsewhere also exist here. Um, this is part of why the VEP was created was um, providing some level of review where we find vulnerabilities that those have enough import uh, to potentially affect the United States that those will be shared from offense to defense. Uh, there, I, I think, expanding what Gary said about there are mission areas, offenses mission areas tend to be very specific. They're operational, they are tied to particular things, they're highly sensitive. You don't have that as much on the defensive side other than where some other mission is being done and it's the assurance that those communications and data can be protected. Uh, so uh, you can't just mash offense and defense together. It doesn't just work that way. Um, the other thing that I would offer at a more technical view, and this is a complete hypothesis because there is nobody I know in the world that has a view on how all of the offensive cyber works at all of the countries, particularly the ones that don't work together. I can only speak to what I've seen um, I personally believe that the vulnerability research and development programs are all unique enough with different countries that you get very little what I'll call collision or overlap. So the vulnerabilities that we find are always going to inherently be different on average to the ones that are found elsewhere. Um, so that's just that's a personal opinion. It's a total hypothesis. I have zero data and I don't think you're ever going to find anybody with data on it. Uh, going back to uh, then the defensive side of this, uh, we've seen the push for CISA to become more of what I'll call like the clearinghouse for the U.S. government. I think that's valuable. Uh, I think that it's probably worth continuing to look at, while the law does not quite allow this today, um, how DOD could be involved more on the domestic side under civilian CISA uh, administration under set terms and conditions not just willy-nilly letting the military run around trying to defend things, but having a process for doing that when, um, and I think in the beginning, start with large emergency disasters like we do with FEMA and our hurricane. We have had issues like that. Look at the way Ireland had to respond to the ransomware incident on their healthcare system. You had the military in there in health and in, in hospitals applying patches and updates. 
uh, because sometimes you just need a surge in a certain kind of uh, of uh, human power to be able to accomplish something. And it, you know, we can work in levels of increased technical sophistication for more complex things as we start to get a basic process and framework and the updated legal authorities to do that. Yeah, I mean, that actually exists, um, just like it does in other disaster relief areas, et cetera. You know, there, there are ways that the Department of Defense can provide capability and capacity and support of other civil authorities like DHS. Um, you know, the parameters of that, how you structure that, those are all really, you know, difficult questions that you have to work through in any given case. Um, you know, but it's also a function, all this involves at some level, data collection and retention. And, and that is implicative of a lot of different legal constraints. And I go back to that earlier point of who's doing what. Um, and so, you know, in that scenario, you're really talking more about the internal defensive network capabilities of DOD may be helping in accordance with the authorities of DHS or the FBI, um, right? And what authorities do the DHS and FBI have to collect data, retain data, use data? That can be very different than say, the authorities that the NSA has under FISA and that complex set of laws and statutes. Um, and so you, you can't just, mesh them together, there's a reason why you have the, that, that mission role and responsibility divided up um, to, to be consonant with those different legal and policy frameworks, but they have to be coordinated and synchronized. Thanks, Bo. Um, so I have another set of questions actually from uh, our uh, audience. Um, so we've talked a lot about sort of the government landscape when it comes to offensive cybersecurity um, but does the private sector play any role uh, when it comes to offensive cybersecurity? Uh, if so, can you elaborate a bit on that? Uh, yeah, currently the private sector is involved throughout the entire uh, attack chain from development to in certain circumstances operations. Uh, what we haven't seen is the same level of uh, proxy use that we see elsewhere. Um, my hypothesis is I think that's going to change um i think that there's only it, it's like so many things uh it, as as it gets older and more mature and we start to have to get more creative and we need a lot more flexibility i think that you're going to see that follow what we've already seen uh the our our adversaries do what about the one idea that's been thrown around a couple of times for corporations that are getting like hit with a lot of attacks is what about the idea of corporations having the capacity to be proactive um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. You, you, what, just call it what it is, Catherine. It's uh, hack back, right? Yes, yes, hack back. Let's, let's hack back. Uh, I uh, think this is a stupid idea, if I can be um, opinionated. You can. Uh, my view, never poke the bear. It's an emotional response. It's something where I feel better having done it, but what have I accomplished? And in this case, I think you've accomplished little. If you are successful, you've poked the bear. The economic utility of these kinds of attacks is driven by what we colloquially call wetware. There are people on the other side who made those decisions. And trying to hack back does not get your data back. Once it's gone, it's gone. It doesn't do anything worse than like the worst case scenario. What are you going to do? You're going to burn their infrastructure. Well, it's not, it doesn't cost a lot to build that back up. And then they're going to come back because now they're going to be emotionally provoked. The difference is they've got nothing to lose. Um, so unless you can shift that economic utility at the operator level, you're not going to be able to affect anything. And as far as I know, corporations can't legally do that other than what we have seen where they have been a part of attribution operations to hand that information over to law enforcement. Uh, so that again, now you're getting to the operator. Uh, and I always like to give a big shout out to a lot of the big tech companies who have been very proactive in botnet takedowns and different um, offensive infrastructure takedowns. So removing that gray space um, at a, a macro scale. Yeah, I mean, yes, it is prohibited generally by federal law, right? The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act prohibits gaining unauthorized access and, and a host of other things, which most hacking back, 
um, except for some, I would say, pretty benign on the edge things maybe, um, would fall within that. So you'd have to amend federal law in some way to authorize this. And if you do that, I go back to my earlier point about attribution. Um, are you now placing in the hands of the private sector decisions about national security implicative actions? Because if you have North Korea that's responding the way it did in Sony because it was simply offended by how a, a film is being produced, um, what might be the response if companies are hacking back, right? And that could cause problems pretty quickly. Those are decisions that should not be, I think, made in the in sort of the vigilante private sector. Those should be held within the government. What is, so we've talked a little bit about um, misconceptions and about concerns about escalation, things that might people might be worrying a bit too much about, but what are people not worrying enough about? What keeps you guys up at night? Well, um, nothing, maybe you guys get really good sleep. I, this is why I do the Hack the Plant podcast to do all my work with critical infrastructure. I'm really afraid that uh, we are increasingly vulnerable on the critical infrastructure front. Um, and we have not invested at across all levels. It's not just a tech problem, right? There are legal elements that we need to, to do for this. There are policy elements. There are investments that we need to make. And I think we're playing catch up. So that being said, I do not fear the cyber Pearl Harbor. I do fear the death by a thousand paper cuts, but I think somebody is going to make a mistake at some point and there's going to be a tragic loss of life. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, a couple of different areas. It, it is that potential for cascading effects and that is mostly a critical infrastructure piece. I mean, if we just look at what it was short lived, it was recoverable, but the, the colonial pipeline, you know, that's just a little bit of a, an insight moment, um, you know, multiply that across the country and multiply that across, you know, two or three different critical infrastructure areas. You could have a lot of devastating impact, right? Um, I think part of that is, and to some earlier points, the blind spots that we generally have uh, with respect to domestic infrastructure, which is all about, I mean, it's just pounded all the time. You hear it all the time, public, private, what's the cooperation? What's the information flow? There's hurdles in both directions. We have got to start getting away from just highlighting what's hard. And, you know, hard is not a synonym of impossible. We got to get after figuring that out. Um, and the other piece that I would say is where we're really playing catch up, which is amazing to me because, you know, it's the area of influence operations and disinformation. This isn't hacking, this is dissemination of, of information by sort of normal means across the internet. This pre-existed the internet, but suddenly we spent, you know, 20 years or so focused on the cyber effects piece and the threat. And now we're waking up to the fact that the internet can be used at scale to really cause, uh, you know, damage to democratic institutions and other things. That is something we've really got to get our hands around. So as you guys know, uh, and maybe our audience doesn't know this, but uh, Cyber 101 uh, was created for you know people with a very basic level of, of cybersecurity, um, understand cyber better, but it was particularly uh, designed to help Hill staffers. Um, and as we think about policymakers on the Hill who are maybe grappling with um, cyber issues, do you think the Congress is properly understand the ins and outs of um, offensive cyber operations, and do you have any suggested action items um, for Congress to improve our offensive cyber operations? More. Um, uh, so I think the, the thing that I, I will point out is, um, so I can't remember what Army Cyber used to be called, but they, they renamed themselves Army Information Warfare. And I think that's indicative of how as much as I mean, as we're having a whole panel on this, the relative investment in these capabilities uh, does not approach what we see on the kinetic side. And th so the capabilities have not matured to a level where um, they, they, they can do more than they do. 
Um, I, I, I personally think that cyber on the battlefield is not, should not be science fiction anymore. Um, I think that our adversaries certainly see that if I'm them, I don't want to go toe to toe with an M1A1 or an M1A2. I, I'd rather either find a way to keep it from getting um, out of the United States so I can fix it in place. Or if I do have to beat it on the battlefield, find that way to prevent it from being able to operate. And I, I don't think we've invested enough in that ourselves. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there are some people who are pretty you know, smart, well steeped on the Hill on these issues. Um, you know, but I, I, I think there are many, many who need to be involved, who, who just don't have the depth of understanding. Um, and that's hard. They're, they're working a thousand issues a day. Um, but this has got to be prioritized. Um, this is, this is probably one of the biggest vulnerability fronts that we have as a nation. And it's not getting better, certainly any, at any pace. Right. And it may only get harder with introduction of more artificial intelligence driven capabilities and other things. Uh, I, I do, I'll go back to my other point. Um, with, there, there's sort of two conflicting trends happening. If you look at the Supreme Court decisions around, you know, in Carpenter and other, how we're looking at data and privacy. Um, but, and I, you know, Bryson's alluded to this several times, in order to be effective in securing ourselves in the cyber domain, you, it's data driven, right? It's, it's data driven. And so do, our legal architecture is understandably very much focused on the privacy side of it. Um, I'm not an anti-privacy advocate, don't get me wrong. But there's, you know, there's, I think, a need for a holistic look at all that and potentially some reform to try and um, level set those two competing interests. Right now, I see them sort of moving in two different directions. Uh, that, that's going to be a big challenge. So I know we're almost out of time, so I'm going to ask you guys one last question um, just briefly uh, that I asked our previous um, guests on the series. But I give you a cyber magic wand. You can fix one thing that has to do with the way the U.S. approaches cyber. What is it? You've been listening to my podcast. Do you also ask this question? Yeah, I've been, I've been oh. doing that for a year. I stole it from you. Well, in that case, answer your own question, please. <laughs> uh, cyber wand to make one thing happen. Um, well, we now have an NCD. Um, I really did not like that we didn't have somebody in the White House on that. So that would have been my, my wand last year. Um, so Chris Inglis now with a staff is there. Um, I would like more investment. Wait, is the question on offensive cyber or cyber in general? Like yeah, I just, I just any of them? Cyber, okay. cyber at large. More cowbell, Bryson. Yeah, more cowbell. So my more cowbell is actually on defensive cyber. Um, I think CISA is underfunded. I think the, the 16 critical infrastructure sectors, I think that needs to be consolidated. I would like that in one defensive cyber agency. I know that's a little controversial. And I would like that place to have serious funding. Um, I think we have not invested enough in that domestically and we live in the glassiest house. Yeah, I mean, your, your magic wand in this space is money. So, um, you know, where you throw it is a bigger, you know, is part of the question. I, and I'll, I'll, I'll wave a broad wand at scale. I mean, rising tide lifts all boats. It's the, like if we can reduce the attack surface, if we can improve security across all sectors, um, right? That's gonna make it that much harder for adversaries to achieve objectives um, and build in resiliency. That's a huge wand to try and wave. So um, to cop out answer in some way. Well, I think we're just about out of time, but thank you guys both so much for joining. It's been a really great discussion. Um, for everyone who's listening, uh, you can we will be putting this up on our website in a few days if you want to go hear it again. Uh, we also have previous entries in the series if anyone missed um, one of our previous discussions and join us again next month. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.